What's poppin' y'all? In 2018, on Drake's Talk Up track on his Scorpion album, Jay-Z would rap, I'm what Meek should've been, I'm what Supreme didn't become. If Alpo didn't snitch, niggas would be like Young. I got your president tweeting, I won't even meet with him. Y'all killed X and let Zimmerman live. Shh, streets is done. What if I told you that the streets was done nearly two decades prior, involving Jay-Z himself, and an individual he worked and still works closely with? If you look up Desiree Perez, there's an article on Hits Daily Double in 2016, where they describe her saying, but after the defection of a string of executives, Title has its third CEO, who exactly is orchestrating these five-star exclusive artist plays. Sources behind the scenes say that person is Desiree Perez, a trusted close associate of Jay-Z for nearly 20 years, who has a long track record running SC Enterprises, and with her husband, OG Juan Perez, runs Rock Nation Sports as well. Perez is known for being a fiercely tough negotiator and rabid numbers cruncher, and has a history and street rep that even Empire's own cookie wouldn't challenge. Dez is a boss. Simply put, insiders point out that she negotiated the Beyonce Formation Stadium Tour and had a strong hand in the Rihanna Samsung deal as well. Impressive. Perez is part of the Hova circle of influence that includes her husband, Jay Brown, Ty Ty Smith, Shaka Pilgrim, and Jana Fleischman. This is the collective running the entire operation of not just Rock Nation and its various wings of management, label operations and publishing, but the forces behind the operation of Title itself. There are a couple of missing pieces to the full bio of Desiree Perez, and I don't know if you really want to say street rep, but I've been eyeing on making this video for the past two or three weeks until 6 9 had to come out and really bring to a larger scale the reports that Desiree Perez, who's the current CEO of Rock Nation, was a government mole and informant back in the mid-90s. This isn't some new information, but it is the biggest scale it's ever blown up on, especially within hip-hop. In a Daily News article from 2014 is when I first remember it being revealed, and the article wasn't even about anything music-related. It was about Alex Rodriguez's suspension from Major League Baseball due to doping, and how Desiree Perez was advising him through what to do afterwards. The headline of the article was, Alex Rodriguez was set to quit baseball until former drug mole and ex-convict Desiree Perez convinced the Yankee slugger to fight MLB over PED suspension. In the article, it talks about how A-Rod was considering retiring and cutting a settlement deal with the MLB so he could just go away quietly after being caught through a test. He spoke with the president of the Yankees to explore an exit strategy, but he told him that his problem was with the MLB, not the Yankees. And Desiree Perez came in and forced him back on the team, according to a source. When Levine declined, telling Rodriguez that his problem was with MLB and not the team, Perez confronted A-Rod with demands to return to the field, according to one source familiar with the strategy. This is when Desiree Perez hijacked the process and forced him back on the team, the source said. At one point, after Rodriguez missed a minor league rehab game because of a tight quad and the Yankees asked him to return to New York for an MRI, Perez helped locate a doctor to review the test and find there was no strain, according to the source. The plan backfired when SNY and the news reported that the orthopedist, Dr. Michael Gross, had been disciplined by the New Jersey State Board of Medical Examiners for failing to adequately ensure proper patient treatment involving the prescribing of hormones, including steroids. This was her ploy to expose the Yankees and take retirement out of Alex's hands, the source said. She thought she had a gotcha moment when Gross said the MRI didn't indicate a strain. Despite the goof, A-Rod was apparently still taking Perez's advice on August 2nd, after smacking a home run in Trenton during his minor league rehab assignment, Rodriguez told the media that the Yankees and MLB were conspiring to push him out of baseball. I think that's the pink elephant in the room, said Rodriguez, claiming people are finding creative ways to cancel his contract. Rodriguez's attorneys knew immediately that his attack would derail the diplomacy required for a settlement. A day later, overtures from the Rodriguez camp were rebuffed by baseball officials. Desiree Perez was basically trying to go around the MLB to try and get Alex Rodriguez back on the field. This is clearly not a good idea when you've been busted for performance enhancing drugs and trying to negotiate a settlement deal with the MLB themselves for your multi-million dollar contract. So how did following Perez's advice work out for A-Rod in this situation? 
Two days later, Commissioner Bud Selig hit Rodriguez with a 211 game ban. They wanted to embarrass the Yankees, one source said. Cost them money. That dynamic. That is why Desiree Press gave an ultimatum to A-Rod. That is why they wanted the Yankees to play him. The result was an all-out assault on the Yankees, MLB and Selig, Bosch, the Yankees doctor, the arbitrator that would hear Rodriguez's appeal of the suspension, the media, and anyone else they got in the way. At one point, A-Rod's supporters showed up at his arbitration hearing on Park Avenue with signs comparing Levine to the devil. There were accusations denied by Levine that his contract for a bonus if he could get the Yankees out from A-Rod's massive deal. Scratch the commissioner's eyes out and kick the Yankees in the shin is how Rodriguez lawyer David Cornwell, speaking at Villanova Sports Law Symposium, described the strategy that led to Rodriguez's suspension for the entire 2014 season. Nothing was more important than the effort to smear, intimidate, and outspend Bosch. Discrediting the witness who knew the most about A-Rod's doping was a top priority, and the best ammunition was to call him out for having been forced to cooperate with authorities. Bosch had his back against the wall and had no chance but to flip against his friend. It was a position Perez knew all too well. Taking Desiree Perez's advice got him the longest suspension in the history of Major League Baseball and the loss of over $20 million in base salary for that 2014 season. The Bosch that they're referring to is Anthony Bosch, who was the owner of Biogenesis. That was a massive scandal. It was basically an anti-aging clinic, but it really supplied performance-enhancing drugs to not only professional baseball players, but anybody that wanted him. He himself was under fire after a 2013 article in the Miami New Times where a former employee gave them documents that showed a massive list of professional athletes who were clients like Ryan Braun, Nelson Cruz, and of course Alex Rodriguez. But the paper didn't want to give the proof to MLB. And what happened was that both the MLB and the Florida Department of Health took legal action against Anthony Bosch in order to get them to basically tell the people he worked with. And he agreed to work with them to have his name removed from the lawsuit. And in the end, he pled guilty to one charge of conspiracy to distribute testosterone. And he got sentenced to four years, but they cut his sentence down by 16 months for his cooperation with the MLB and giving them all the decoded nicknames they had, the messages explaining everything they needed. And this was the same period of time Desiree Perez was starting Rock Nation Sports. But let's get into what the article says about her snitching. It says, But multiple sources told the Daily News that A-Rod's last chance for a dignified exit ended when he turned to Desiree Perez, a Manhattan nightclub manager with a lengthy criminal record and close links to hip-hop mogul Jay-Z. While Perez is not an employee, officer, or agent of Jay-Z's new agency, Rock Nation Sports, sources say she is a major behind-the-scenes influence. She's directly involved with the athletes, one baseball insider said, she has a lot of power. Perez is also a convicted felon, with a long and wild history as a DEA cooperating witness and then a fugitive. She wore wires to meet with major cocaine traffickers, according to federal court transcripts obtained by the Daily News. Perez declined numerous interview requests and did not respond to questions submitted to her attorneys about her past. If you never heard about this, it's sort of like getting hit so hard your head is just spinning. Your entire reality shakes up a bit, you get dizzy vision. How the hell is Jay-Z so close with an individual like this that is reported to have broken one of the most sacred codes that Jay-Z claims he holds? Dame Dash was even frightened by it. In an interview with Sway, he said, This is the one time that the paper did scare me. I read about his affiliation with an informant, that he's in business with certain people. It's tricky for me to say, but just based on where I'm from, I can't have nothing to do with that. There's no more business being done with me and him until I understand the situation. And court records were obtained by the newspaper, and they said as follows. Perez was a 26-year-old mother of young children in 1994 when she was arrested in New York for possession with intent to distribute 35 kilograms of cocaine, according to court records reviewed by the news. Federal authorities charged she was part of a drug conspiracy stretching from New York to Florida to Puerto Rico. She and co-defendant Amari Lopez faced at least 10 years in prison. Lopez was supposedly one of at least three men to marry Perez since the late 1980s. But Perez cooperated in return for telling the DEA everything and putting herself at substantial risk, as one prosecutor put it. 
She was sentenced to 30 months in a military style boot camp program in 1995. Basically, they sent her to the adult version of the Girl Scouts. Many of the records in Perez's case were sealed soon after her arrest. But one transcript from a June 11, 1996 court hearing obtained by the news showed the feds were pleased with their star mole. The defendant has really worked closely with these agents, Assistant U.S. Attorney Lawrence Bardfeld told the judge that day, arguing to keep Perez out of jail. Miami-based defense attorney Alan Ross told the judge that his client wore a wire on no less than the four or five occasions when she's been down there in Puerto Rico. And I think the court knows from its experience that you just can't do anything more dangerous than wear a wire and go into an undercover meeting in Puerto Rico with a known violator, one who's suspected of or being investigated for a murder case down there. The transcript describes how a mutual regard and respect developed between Perez and the DEA special agent she worked with to bust Colombians moving cocaine shipments of 50 to 100 kilograms. She has gone the extra mile, an extra gold store, said Ross, adding that he believed the defendant was fully rehabilitated. Perez was released that July and placed on five years of supervised release. She began working at night spots in Miami Beach and was scheduled to meet her probation officer at one of them, Club Onyx, when she skipped town without notice in early August 1997. The fugitive resurfaced nine months later in Brooklyn, where she was arrested on March 5, 1998. Perez was charged with grand larceny, criminal use of drug paraphernalia, and criminal possession of a firearm. Her probation was revoked and she was sentenced to nine months in prison. Just nine months? and three years of supervised release. Oh, they cut her a pretty nice deal. A DEA special agent from the case contacted by the news declined to comment. Isn't that one hell of a story? In the excerpt, it talks about a bunch of her marriages, which I don't think a single one of them you could say was normal. The first man she got married to was Joel Reynoso in 1988, and she had two children with him, and their marriage ended with his death in 1995 when he died in a parachuting accident on Long Island, in Long Island, I should say. This information was brought to light in a separate New York Post article from August of 2004. The topic of the article is Desiree wanted to get married, but she went to get the license and they said she was already married to two other individuals. And she said she had no idea who the hell they were. What made me scratch my head though, is that Amari Gonzalez, as we saw earlier, was her co-defendant in that case. And this is the guy she was doing the crime with in 1994, while she was married to her original husband, a year before her husband died. And it's also the same guy she married in 1998, three years after her husband died of a parachuting accident. Because the majority of these articles back then referred to her as Desiree Gonzalez, not Desiree Perez, because she was married to Amari Gonzalez. I just found it really odd that the guy she was doing crime with while married to her husband and then her husband dies a year later and she marries that same guy according to the article three years later. Moving forward though, she was trying to get married in 2004. At the clerk's office, Gonzalez was told she was also married to two other men, but the clerk wouldn't tell her who. Gonzalez got Colbert involved and he learned that the other grooms were a man named Guillermo Gutierrez and another named Hector Saldariaga, two people Gonzalez didn't know. A private investigator was hired to find the men the judge refers to as the phantom husbands, but the addresses listed on the license were phonies, as were Gonzalez's address and signature on the forms, Colbert said. The city said it couldn't avoid the marriages without the phantom husbands and then questioned whether Gonzalez's divorce filings and her late husband's death certificate were authentic. Gonzalez declined comment and would not identify her fiance. She got a lawyer and managed to get it resolved. And as we can see, a recurring theme is that Desiree does not like speaking to reporters or the media ever. I can't really blame her. We know who her fiance is now, and it was Juan Perez, also known as OG Juan, who was a close friend of Jay-Z since 1996. But these are some really weird situations that Desiree Perez coincidentally keeps just falling into. But what isn't a coincidence is the poor business practices that were reported in the 2000s when she was part owner of Jay-Z's club named 4040. In 2002, the liquor license was listed under Desiree's father's name, Epifiano Gonzalez from the Bronx, as president, director, and 50% stockholder, with Jay-Z as the other 50%. Things just went smooth sailing from there, right? I mean, she had the whole marriage issue, 
She served a couple of months of time when she ran away after having allegedly helped the DEA take down cartels in Puerto Rico and Colombia. It was time for no problems, a new life. Like the DEA said, fully rehabilitated. Well, not quite. 2003 was littered with lawsuits for the club that she was running by contractors who said they weren't paid. And here's the proof. On her screen is a document sent to Desiree Gonzalez, and it says, Action for goods sold and delivered having the agreed price and reasonable value of $18,528.80. No part of which has been paid, except the sum of $5,420, by reason of which a balance of $13,108 remains due and unpaid. Action on a check returned for insufficient funds in the sum of $7,000. What happened was Ronald Mark Associates were supposed to be paid 18 grand to manufacture about 30 tables for the club. After they received the $5,000 down payment, they did the work and the company asked for the rest, like right before the club was about to open. And the club stalled for a week and then they sent them a check for only half of the 13,000, a little more than half, that they still owed, but the check ended up bouncing. Club employees have since ducked phone calls, said Leslie Satz, Ronald Mark's chief executive. No one's done what these guys did. They played off the Jay-Z name and reputation and then tried to bully us, Satz said. My theory is that because of who he is, they think you'll feel blessed to have your stuff there. That's not the only one. On your screen now is papers filed on behalf of the Amerabuild Construction Management Company. At number six, ACM provided construction management services and materials, including but not limited to lumber and drywall, to 21s from January 7, 2003 through February 25, 2003, for use by 21s on a construction project at the premises. The construction management services and materials provided to 21s had an agreed upon and reasonable value of $8,114.59, for which ACM has not been paid. Despite due demand, 21s has failed and refused to pay said sum. As a result of the foregoing, ACM is entitled to a judgment against 21s for $8,114.59 plus interest from February 25th, 2003. So these guys supplied lumber and drywall to the club, and they also received a check in February for the amount of $8,145, but that check ended up bouncing too. And then they were told it's just an accounting thing. And of course, they didn't end up getting another payment before they filed suit. It wasn't just regular companies that were receiving checks that couldn't be cashed from the club Desiree Perez was running. It was also the state liquor authority. They gave them a check that bounced for $8,914 when they were applying for a liquor license. In the article, it says, making matters worse, the club ignored an SLA notice regarding the rubber check wrap, which led to its application initially being rejected. State records show that Jay-Z, real name Sean Carter, is equal partners in the 4040 Club with one Epifanio Gonzalez, a 67-year-old Bronx man. When contacted Thursday afternoon, 4040 Club manager Desiree Gonzalez announced, I don't speak to reporters, before hanging up on TSG. This is also the document sent by the State of New York Division of Alcoholic Beverage Control to their office. Dear sir or madam, your check for your license drawn on Chase was returned to us because of insufficient funds. This was applied to your license 1134648. Please submit to this office no later than December 20th, 2002, a money order or certified check of $8,914 made payable to the New York State Liquor Authority. The check should be mailed to, and there's the address. Okay, this is terrible business practice. Why do they have insufficient funds when Jay-Z was rolling around filthy rich with commercials, a clothing line, and music? Who knows? But maybe Desiree Prez was just like this with contractors, and maybe the liquor authority. She was probably paying others, right? Well, it sounds like musicians weren't getting paid. On a New York Post article from June 26, 2007, that has also been scrubbed from the internet, but I managed to work around, it says, Mega stars Michael Jackson, R. Kelly, and more than a dozen music publishers have banned together against Jay-Z's 4040 Club wrapping the Chelsea hotspot with a federal lawsuit for allegedly skimping on royalties. The popular 4040 Club, co-owned by Jay-Z and two business partners, has danced around licensing rules to entertain clubgoers with unauthorized public performance of musical compositions, according to a lawsuit filed yesterday in Manhattan Federal Court. Broadcast Music Inc. led the charge on behalf of Jackson and more than a dozen artists and music publishing companies, 
seeking unspecified damages for copyright infringement from the club and co-owners Desiree Gonzalez, who has the primary responsibility for operations and management, and Juan Perez. Jay-Z, whose real name is Sean Carter, is not named. Jackson's, Billie Jean and Don't Stop, Thoya Thoing by R. Kelly, and Gold Digger by Kanye West. Kanye West too, man. Ray Charles and Ronald Richard were among seven unlicensed songs played at the club during a random visit by a BMI researcher on two nights in March 2006. Even singer Pharrell Williams, who was frequently collaborated with Jay-Z in the past, was not immune. His song Touch was also played without license. BMI spokesman Jerry Bailey said the company holds the licensing rights to 6.5 million songs, roughly half of those played in the United States, and has tried unsuccessfully to license the 4040 Club since it opened in 2003. They said, yo, let's license you this music, and the club said, nah, nah, nah we're not paying for that. The lavish sports bar and lounge on West 25th Street boasts a $4 million multi-level space with dozens of televisions to view sporting events and several private VIP rooms. Michael Shen, a lawyer for the club, said he had not yet seen the lawsuit and declined further comment. Okay, okay. The contractors filed a lawsuit. The Liquor Authority suspended their license until they got their payment. BMI now filed a lawsuit for them not paying music royalties. All that's left is the employees. They gotta be happy, right? Well. No, it doesn't seem like that. On July 2nd, 2008, an article in the New York Post is headlined, Judge Raps Jay-Z Club in Lawsuit. A Manhattan judge has paved the way for a class action lawsuit against rapper Jay-Z and his nightclub 4040, ordering Brass to fork over the names of all employees over the last three years. The suit was filed in the name of Celeste Williams, a former waitress who claims the hotspot didn't pay overtime or minimum wage. This is a good day for restaurant workers all over the city, said her lawyer, Maimon Kirschenbaum, who will now try to reach out to hundreds of other club workers to see whether they want to join the suit. He said between 10 and 20 past and present 40-40 bartenders, waiters, and other workers are already on board. He doesn't know how much money they are entitled to because he hasn't been able to access 4040's records completely. Ron Berkowitz, a spokesperson for the Brooklyn-born rapper, said the club is not settling this lawsuit because they are innocent. We're taking this to court and we're letting the judge decide. Well, damn, you wasn't paying the contractors, the liquor authority, and now they're saying you're not even paying the employees? Not just overtime, but not even minimum wage? But don't worry, it gets better. Because less than a week later, on July 14th, 2008, which is now a deleted webpage, but of course, I was able to find a workaround, on the New York Post, it said, Desiree Gonzalez, the general manager of 4040, told an employee she would F up his tax life for getting involved in the messy class action lawsuit staffers lodged against the Chelsea Club owned by Jay-Z, according to a letter filed in court by the lawyer for the workers. The hot-tempered boss allegedly told another staffer she'd lock him up if he didn't sign a release from the suit, which accuses the club of paying waiters, bartenders, and other staffers below minimum wage. Sheesh. These bullying tactics seem to be the bread and butter of Desiree Perez, because a YouTube channel and website by the name of Hip Hop News Uncensored were doing an interview with DeHaven Irby, who was one of Jay-Z's best friends back then, pretty much his best friend, grew up on the same floor as him, and a large amount of lyrics on Reasonable Doubt are about him. They say they were pressured to take something down. How do you feel, feel about uh, Desiree Perez, Rock Nation? You know, um, there, there was a, um, I was, you know, about what went down with the cartels and everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we actually, we actually did a story, we posted a story on um, our website, and Rock Nation lawyers sent us an email demanding us to take it down. You know, what I mean, about her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a fact. But what? how do you, how do you, feel, how do you feel about that? Um, about Jay Z appointing her head of Rock Nation, knowing her checkered past with the DEA, FBI, and all that. How do you feel about that? What else you going to do? <laughs> you working with him. What else you going to do? You know what I'm saying? Um, she going to be around. You know what I'm saying? That's what's just like suspicious to me. You know what I mean? Um, homegirl got a strong position in there. And it's crazy that you know her background. And you know what we stand for. So it's just self-explanatory. You know what I'm saying? You, you, you working with him or you... You got to be working with them. As far as I'm concerned, Rock Nation is run by government. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Why, why, would, why would people think the government don't run businesses? You don't think by right now that they've got a major rapper that's a snitch, that's an informant? Oh, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. You don't think in 2020 that they don't have a major rapper that's an informant? Come on, man. 6 ix 9 recently spoke on how is Meek Mill, or as the game funnily called him, Meeky Mouse, going to be about this prison reform stuff and calling 6 ix 9 a snitch, while he's very close with Desiree Perez, who is said to be involved with wearing a wire to send people to prison. 6 9 is of course in no position to speak because he ratted on an individual that he sent to do the crime for him. That's irredeemable. But we're not going to shoot down the message with the messenger. And I'm going to assume that Meek Mill didn't even know. But you know now. And if you continue without at least denouncing these actions, then your word and honor is absolutely worthless. This includes Griselda Records, who are admitted coke crack dealers, specifically Benny the Butcher, who in an interview with DJ Vlad said he would burn his phone right in front of him if Takashi called him to do a song. I wonder if he's burning it when Desiree is calling that she got him booked for some money. Let me just play a quick clip of my thoughts that's summed up great by Benny himself. This shit, this shit bad out here. This shit bad, man. When these rats got the confidence to do what they doing, this shit bad out here. I'm, I'm happy I ain't in the streets no more. That's a fact, man. The streets is dead, man. You're right, Benny. It really is bad out here when these supposed rats got the confidence to do what they be doing. Like running Rock Nation, the company you're signed under. Let's look at the list of, as they claim themselves, real street niggas on Rock Nation. There's Meek Mill, Max O'Cream, all of Griselda, Jim Jones, the big bad goon Casanova himself, and even Yo Gotti, CMG man, they had the benefit of the doubt of not knowing. But now they all know. They saw that live at 6ix9ine, guaranteed. And so I expect a statement or disavowal from every single one of these rappers because they got no problem talking about snitching when it's convenient. Your morals aren't tested when times are easy. They're put to the test when it's difficult. And if you can't say something for the laws that you signed up for and you propagate, then you're nothing but a hypocrite whose word means nothing that deserves to be ruled over by what you would call a rat. Do you think any of them will say anything? Let me know in the comments. Like and subscribe and hit the notification bell if you enjoyed. It really helps a lot. Thank you for watching. Peace.